The first time I really got inspired was watching Elvis Presley on The Ed Sullivan Show, and there were a bunch of girls screaming and crying, and he was gyrating, and it had such just a raw energy and electricity to it that I just got really inspired and said, that's what I want to do. I, I would like to be able to do that, and started studying uh, everything I could about guitar. Uh, the first guitar I had, I traded a handful of cherry bombs to a kid across the street for a broken, kind of cracked uh, acoustic guitar he had in the top of his closet and found a guy around the corner that uh, showed me how to tune it, uh, saved up enough money to buy the replacement strings for the strings that were missing, and he taught me the song Red River Valley, which was the first song I ever learned how to play. And I would sit on my, my mom's porch on this metal glider going back and forth and back and forth for hours playing Red River Valley. It was like the only thing I knew how to play. During the day, uh, the radio stations in Gainesville used to play really kind of very uh, white bread songs. Like you'd turn on and you'd hear Pat Boone singing Tutti Frutti. And at night after sundown, if the weather was good between Gainesville and Nashville, you could hear WLAC, and you could hear Little Richard screaming Tutti Frutti, and the difference was just amazing, right? And so I'd studied everything I could get off of B.B. King, everything I could get off of Albert King. Those early blues records, really, is where I cut my teeth. And then I remember meeting B.B. King for the first time when I was 14. It was interesting in the South because he was playing in a barn outside of, of town. Uh, and they had taken a door and turned it down on bales of hay, and that was their bar with a couple of uh, kegs of beer uh, that were served in, you know, just plastic cups and stuff. And BB uh, came out and he played four sets the whole night. And I was myself and the other guy that I went with were the only two white kids there, and we stood outside and peered in through the window to watch these sets, and people were screaming, oh my God, B.B., tell it like it is, and women were crying and just unbelievably moved by his playing and singing, and in between sets, he would go back into the back of this barn and sit down on a bale of hay in an area where those stalls were, so I crept around the back of this barn and went in where he was and introduced myself, told him I'd been listening to it on WLAC, I'd learned, I'd bought the Jungle album, I'd learned everything on it and how much I admired it. He was the most gracious, kind, generous uh, guy I'd met. My heart was just pounding with you know that typical fear, but it was just a wonderful experience early on in my life that really set the bar for how an artist should address everyone. You know, the whole Hotel California thing came together uh, in between uh, the time period where we finished uh, one of these nights. We're out on the road, we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. I had been told by Bernie Ledden that if I wanted to write songs with the Eagles, meaning Don and Glenn, the two songwriters there, that I should write music beds. You can hint at melodies, you can give them song lyric ideas, but just give them music beds to write to. Uh, so I had made a tape of about 15 or 16 song ideas, one of which was my demo of Hotel California that I made in my back bedroom with acoustic 12 string, me playing bass, a rolling drum machine, uh, trying to simulate a guitar part between Joe and I, me playing the reggae part, pretty, pretty much uh, the basics of the whole concept musically came out of that demo. Uh, I did some solo stuff on the end of it that when we got into the studio down in Miami, uh, as a matter of fact, it really should have been called Hotel Miami because we recorded more of it in Miami than we did in California. But um, we were down there and it came time for us to record the, stu the solos, Joe and I. So Joe and I are sitting in the studio with two guitars and we're just going at each other, trading off, trading off, and Hindley comes walking in and says, stop, what are you doing? That's not right. I said, what do you mean that's not right? He said, you got to play it just like the demo. He had been listening to the demo over and over, for over a year now. And I said, well, I don't know what the, what I played. I just made that up, you know? He said, well, we got to get that so you can learn it. So I had to call my housekeeper back in Malibu, and she went through a bunch of cassettes, put the, the cassette, the original demo cassette, in the blaster 
played it and put the phone up to it so we could record it in Miami so I could sit and learn what I'd just, you know, thrown off the cuff. And he was right. It was a very kind of unique, uh, melodic uh, progression that had been written, but the notes in that solo fell right where the chords were supposed to go. And so uh, I guess about the first part of the solo we did that, and then Joe and I just kind of went for it after that, you know, so... Well, there's a real variety on this record. Uh, some of the things on there, like Rock You, with me and Sammy Hagar singing this rock duet, and me and Satriani playing these just smoking guitar. i got to tell you, I've played with a lot of people, and I have never been more frightened to be standing in a control room with me and Joe Satriani, who's an absolute monster, working out these guitar parts, and it pushed me outside of my safe zone. It's like, i got to step up and do this. I can't rely on licks. So Joe and I worked out these really fun, great harmony things and answering solos and just put it together in a really unique way that I, I really think for rock guitar on this record, that's one of my favorites. The, uh, the level of competency of every one of the guest musicians, whether it was Mick Fleetwood or Chad Smith or Slash or, or Frampton or, or you know, Richie Sambora or Anthony, was just incredible. And whoever I threw the hat to, here, your turn, you go for it, just step up and just crush it, you know. Alec Lyson, you know, I don't know if you know who he is from Canada, but uh, he and I had done a bunch of charity work together, and I knew Neil Peart fairly well, and he told me before it came out that he was done playing. Uh, at a birthday party where my band was playing, and Stills came over and said it, and we were just having a birthday jam. So I said, Neil, come on up and play, you know, Pride and Joy with us. So he said, no, I'm not, I stopped playing. I went, you, what? Yeah, I quit. I'm done. I'm not playing drums anymore. So I knew Alex was just sitting around twiddling his thumbs, waiting for something to do besides playing golf. So I sent him this email and said, hey, I'm working on this record. Would you like to play? He said, yeah, when, where, what are we doing? You just send me the tracks or whatever, I'm going to do it. So I sent him the stems because he was in Canada. And he wrote me back and said, well, where do you want me to play on this? I said, I am not going to tell you to play anything. You know how to do this. You hear whatever you want, you play it. 